looking at this passage two weeks ago, and we covered a, a great portion of it, but there is yet more that needs to be looked at. The first part of Matthew 16, 13 through 20, deals with discerning who Jesus actually is. Uh, the latter part deals with his kingdom. So we'd like to review some of what we talked about uh, to get us up to speed. There are seven topics of discussion in this passage of scripture. The first one is consensus. Who do people say that I, the son of man, am? And uh, so they gave him some answers as to what people were saying. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? The second part then is the confession, that which Peter said in Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is the truth. Jesus is the son of the living God, the only one who will ever be as he was at that time. There is no one else who has ever been or ever will be that is both human and divine at the same time. He is truly the son of the living God and Peter confessed this fact before him. Next was the commendation. God revealed it to him and Jesus said, blessed are you because God revealed this to him. But revealed what? Revealed what to Peter? The truth that Jesus is the son of the living God. That's the truth he confessed and that's what God had revealed to him. The next part of this passage is the confirmation. Jesus agrees. Blessed are you that God has revealed this to you. So Jesus agrees and confirms the truth that Peter confessed. Next, we had some conclusions as that we could draw from what had been presented, and this is where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Jesus, one of the conclusions is, is the only one who can save mankind. He is the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. As we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 later on, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus is the only one. You can't get to God through Muhammad or Buddha or any other person that has ever lived on the face of the earth. It is only through Jesus Christ that salvation is found. Well, that brings us up to what we want to look at today, and that is number six of the seven is the church. And we're going to spend most of our time, we will get to number seven, uh, it'll be much more brief, but we're spending most of our time today on this from Matthew 16 and verse 18. Peter had said, you are the Christ, now Jesus says, you are Peter. And then he talks about building his church on the rock. What is the rock? Is it Peter? No. We'll come back to that later on. But it is the truth that Peter confessed. That is the rock, the fact that he is the son of the living God. He builds his church on that truth. No other religious group anywhere can possibly ever be built on a truth like this because as we've already stated, Jesus is the only one who ever has been or ever will be the son of the living God. For that reason, the church continues to exist because Christ continues to exist. He's not buried in a tomb somewhere. He arose from the dead and serves to be the head of the church, which we'll talk about more in just a few moments. Now, we do want to point something out, and that is that this is the first time that the word church 
occurs in the New Testament. All in all, that word occurs 115 times. Over 20 of those are in the book of Acts. So there are some things we want to notice then about what Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Number one, Jesus says he is the builder. He is the builder. No man built the church. No group of men built the church. No committee. It was not uh, shuffled off to a committee to try to get something done. Religious denominations were not built by Jesus. He built his church. So he is the builder and the only builder of it. It was not built by men. It had nothing to do with men. It is established upon the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Second, Jesus is the builder of this spiritual temple that is referred to as the church. Uh, we read that the church is the spiritual temple in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5, and that all Christians are living stones in this temple. It is a somewhat of a comparison to the temple that Solomon built in the Old Testament, but those were made out of material uh, things, stones. The church is built of living stones. It consists of people, individuals, who are Christians, that is, followers of Christ. The third thing we want to notice about Matthew 16, 18, is that when Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church, that means it is his. It belongs to him. Jesus did not say, I'm going to build a Lutheran church. Of course, people would have looked at him like he was crazy because they would not know who that was since he would not be born for 1,500 years in the future. He did not say, I'm going to build a Baptist church. I'm going to build a Wesleyan church. I'm going to build a Mormon church. He didn't say any of those things. He said, I'm going to build my church. The church word church is singular. Now, that let me just explain that. We do read about churches in the New Testament, but they all belong to him. They are not different denominations. They are all churches that belong to Jesus. They're just in different locations. There's only one church, but it meets in different locations across the world. And we see one more thing in this passage, and that is that his church was yet future. I will build my church. And so it was yet future, but after the day of Pentecost, it was in existence. How do we know that? Well, we'll look at that in just a second. Matthew uses the word church two times. Mark, Luke, and John do not use the word at all. So when we come to the book of Acts, that's the next time that we see it. And that would be in Acts 2 and verse 47. But before we look at that, let's realize that that comes after Acts chapter 2 and verses 38 through 41, which we want to read first before we get to verse 47. So, uh, even though we're going to come back to this later, we want to notice at this particular time that when people asked what they should do, Peter gave a response. And here's what he said. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. 
and with many other words that he testify and exhort them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized and the same day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now it goes on to describe the church a little bit further in the next few verses and then ends with verse 47 saying that the people were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added, same word as in verse 41, added to the church daily those who were being saved. Jesus had said, I will build my church, but this is the next time uh, outside of Matthew that the word is used and the church is now in existence and those who were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins were added to it. And so now the church does exist by the time of Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. So let's review this a little bit more before we go on to the next point. Jesus is the builder of a spiritual temple, the church. It belongs to him, and by the way, it's subject to him as the church is subject unto Christ, Ephesians 5, 25, and he has all authority over it, which he says in Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That includes, of course, authority in the church. His church is singular, not several different bodies with conflicting doctrines. You know, in, in Corinth, there were some who started to have divisions among themselves. And Paul tells them at the outset of the letter that you need to be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. There were not to be different doctrines. There were not to be different churches. Jesus only built one, and they needed to preserve that. And Paul later says in 1 Corinthians 7, 17, I teach the same thing in all the churches. They didn't have different doctrines. They had one doctrine, sometimes referred to as the faith. That's what they had in the first century. And then uh, number five, it was yet future at the time that Jesus said this, but it was in existence by Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Now, all these facts veritably shout, there is one church. Now, who said that? Me? No. Jesus used the word singular, didn't he? Or used singular uh, in uh, number, not plural. I will build my church. Paul also said, there is one body, that is one church. Ephesians 1, and 23, and he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. A few verses later, Ephesians 4.4, 4, there is one body. Now, who wrote, who wrote that? Me? No. I had nothing to do with it. Nobody in this century had anything to do with it. Nobody in the last century had anything to do with it. Paul wrote it in the first century. There is one body, there is one church. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, declared one head, one body, one church. We don't make this up. We simply see that the New Testament teaches this truth. Well, now somebody might take umbrage with this point, even though it comes out of the scriptures, and said, you mean with all the churches out there, you claim there is only one? No, Christ the builder 
said there was only one. His. We must remember that almost every religious group began 1,500 years after Christ established his church. That's kind of a large gap, isn't it? So almost every religious body there is started 1,500 years after Jesus established his church. Now, the next thing somebody might say, well, uh, I suppose uh, you're it. Would, would you want to be part of a church that was not built by Jesus in the first century? Isn't, isn't that an admission, if, if you're satisfied with that, that um, you uh, really don't care about what Jesus taught? That you don't care about what he said? That you don't care what he said in Matthew 16, 18? So somebody might reply, well, what is this church called? Well, since Jesus built it and it belongs to him, how about referring it to it as the church of Christ? Doesn't that make sense? Isn't that logical? Well, okay, somebody might say, but just calling yourselves the church of Christ doesn't mean that you are. That's right, it doesn't. We have a point of agreement here. A religious group must not only call itself in a way that honors Jesus, the owner, the builder of the church, but it must also teach the same plan of salvation that is taught in the New Testament. It has to have the same worship that is taught in the New Testament. And it has to teach the same doctrines that are taught in the New Testament. Otherwise, calling yourself a church of Christ is futile. It doesn't serve any useful purpose. So those things do have to be true for someone to be a genuine church that Jesus built. If we do those things, though, if we have the right plan of salvation, if we have the right New Testament teachings, if we worship in the way that is authorized by the New Testament, then we are that church which Jesus established. If we do not do those things, then we would be like any other religious group founded by mere men. However, we believe we are that church. Our allegiance is to Jesus and his word. Now, Jesus also said one other thing, the gates of Hades, uh, some translations use the word hell, but it's actually the Hadean world that is being referred to here. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. That may be a statement guaranteeing that as long as the world lasts, the church will be there. Or it could also refer to the fact that Jesus, after he died, went to the Hadean realm, but they could not keep him there. The gates of Hades could not keep him there. He arose and the church that he promised to build came into existence. But now we want to talk about the kingdom because we want to make sure that we know what the church is. Now let's hold off on that for a second. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 16 and read verse 19. We looked at verse 18 pretty thoroughly. Verse 19 says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now did you notice what Jesus did there? He used another word for the word church. He has promised he will build his church, but then he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. The kingdom and the church are one and the same. The church is the kingdom. And we might ask, well, what, what kingdom is that? Uh, that is the kingdom 
that is prophesied of in the Old Testament going all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7 and verses 12 and verse 13. Let's take a look at that. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 12 and 13. All right, in this passage, God makes a promise to David, and here's what he says. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, talking about the fact that David would at some day in the future die, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish, establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Solomon built a literal temple. Jesus built a spiritual temple, the church, which is also a kingdom and one that was yet future at the time Jesus spoke. Now there are other passages that testify to that. Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, for example, says uh, that some of you, the kingdom will not, uh, some of you will not die till you have seen the kingdom of God come with power. So the kingdom was yet future, and that's not hard to understand since it's the same as the church and the church was yet future both are yet future Matthew 16 verses 18 and 19 now John had come preparing the way for Jesus and what was the message that he had repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand John is saying the same thing it's yet future but it's going to come soon. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. Then Jesus talked about this kingdom being uh, spiritual in nature when he stood before Pontius Pilate in John 18 and verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then my servants would fight. But now my kingdom is not from here. Why not? It's a heavenly kingdom. That's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. It's a spiritual kingdom, uh, just as is indicated in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, Jesus talked about this kingdom prior to his uh, ascension back into heaven. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, you'll notice that uh, the text says, To whom he also presented himself alive after uh, his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. So Jesus was talking to his disciples during this 40-day period from the time he was raised from the dead to the time he was ascended into heaven. He was talking about things relating to the kingdom of God. And uh, he received that kingdom, which we want to notice in Acts chapter 2 and verses 29 through 35. In that text we read this. As uh, Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you about the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him. Uh, that of the fruit of his body... According to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on this throne. That goes back to 2 Samuel 7, 12, doesn't it? Except Peter is now showing what the fulfillment of that is. He foreseeing this, 
spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, the gates of Hades could not prevail against him, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, yeah, the one that was promised in 2 Samuel 7 and 12, he was raised up and he saw it. He saw that fulfilled. He saw that, given that kingdom. Uh, he has poured forth uh, this, which you now see and hear. So this is the fulfillment of all of that. And then he goes on just to add a little bit more to it. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This is the picture of Christ ascending into heaven to receive his kingdom. It was future during his lifetime, but when he died and rose again and ascended into heaven, he received the kingdom that had been promised to him. Now, there's one other verse we want to read. Go to Daniel chapter 7. And I want you, you know, unless you're directionally challenged, you'll get this. So let's look at it closely. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Beginning with Daniel 7 then and verse 13, we have a vision that is explained in the text. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man, what was Jesus, what did Jesus call himself? Who did I, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? One like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days. Now, which direction is that? Well, we usually think of the Ancient of Days as being above us in heaven, do we not? And yet, premillennialists say, oh, this is Jesus coming from heaven to earth to set up a kingdom. Uh, how can you be that directionally challenged? Notice again what it says clearly. One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days. And then to him was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, just as was prophesied in 2 Samuel 7, 12 and 13. An everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Well, that's nothing more than what is described in the book of Acts and preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost. That he uh, went with the clouds of heaven, Acts 1, 9 through 11. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. He's been given his kingdom. Now, question would anyone say the kingdom is based on Peter? Well, no, Peter doesn't really figure into any of this, does he? Well, then neither is the church based on Peter, since the kingdom and the church are one and the same. The church is built on the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus reigns over this kingdom that was promised to David and described his coronation in Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Now, the last of the seven points is the charge in verse 20. And that charge was a very odd one, we probably would think, after having established this wonderful truth about the kingdom, about the church, about it was going to be built, it was yet future, uh, it would be one body, one church, one kingdom. Jesus says, don't say anything about it. 
Really? Yes, that's what he said. Don't say anything about it. Why? Because it was not the right time, apparently. But after his death and his burial and his resurrection, it would be the right time. And in fact, they would have a different charge. And that charge would not be don't say anything. That charge would be tell everybody, tell everyone about what has occurred. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, and they were to go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things, whatever he had commanded the apostles. So, there is one kingdom, one church, one body of Christ. The question is, are you part of it? This is not a social club. This is not a uh, meeting of like-minded people who have an exclusive uh, venue of some kind. This is the kingdom prophesied in the Old Testament, the church Jesus promised to build. And he ascended into heaven to receive this kingdom, now, we might ask this question, what does the church of Christ teach about salvation? Nothing but what is said on the day of Pentecost. We read it a few moments ago. They asked what they should do, didn't they? And the answer was, repent and let every one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, why don't other groups teach the same thing? Peter spoke it. Why don't other groups teach the same thing? Is it because they are not the church that Christ built? Peter preached the message that we've already looked at, inviting people to repent and be baptized. And 3,000 who gladly received his word, obeyed. But now I want you to compare that with something. Here is a statement made by the Dallas Theological Seminary, probably one of the most prominent religious seminaries in this country. Here's what they say on their website. We believe also that our redemption has been accomplished solely by the blood of Jesus our Lord, or our Lord Jesus Christ, and that no repentance, no feeling, no faith, no good resolutions, no sincere efforts, no submission, no to rules regard, uh, and regulations of any church can add in the very least degree to the value of the blood or to the merit of the finished work wrought uh, for us by him, that is, by Jesus. Now, think about that statement again. Let's look at it one more time. The blood of Jesus is sufficient for our salvation. That's true, isn't it? Repentance and obedience are irrelevant. Oh, wait a minute. That's not true. Didn't Jesus say, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish? Uh, so there we have the blood of uh, Jesus is sufficient. And that's true. That's true, but what does it imply? For them, it implies that you don't have to repent, that you don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. And in fact, you don't even have to believe. Uh, the blood of Jesus is sufficient. Well, it is sufficient. We can't add anything to the blood. What are we going to add to the blood of Christ that is going to cleanse us? Nothing. But that does not imply that we don't have to receive the gift that is offered to us. And in receiving it, we have to believe. We have to repent of our sins. This implies you don't. But you do have to. Why don't people just say what the Bible says? Why do they have to issue statements like this that would just confuse people? Why can't they say the same thing Peter did? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of sins. They don't say that because they don't believe that. They don't believe that because they're not the church that Jesus established. The church that Jesus established has to go by what his apostles taught and by what he taught. Are you in that body? Are you part of the kingdom that was preached by John and Jesus? Or are you going with what some men have established or what some men think or teach? The truth is the only thing that will do you any good. And if we can help you obey that truth this morning, let us know. And we will uh, take your confession that you believe Christ is the Son of the living God. And then we will baptize you if you uh, have repented of your sins. If we can help you spiritually in any way this morning, let us know while we stand and sing for your encouragement. <laughs>